Welcome everybody to a new episode of the KMS Quick Shots. I'm your unshaved host Flo, sorry for that. <laughs> and joining me today is London-based Australian electropop artist Jess Chalker, who just released her new album Hemispheres on November 5th. Hi Jess, nice to meet you. Oh, hi, nice to meet you as well. So before we're going to talk about the album, uh, tell us a bit about your musical journey so far. Uh, did you grow up being a musician? Um, my, my dad owned um, a musical instrument store in Australia called The Guitar Factory, which is pretty well known in, in Sydney, where, I, where I'm from. Um, he doesn't own it anymore, but it's still in my family. So we always had music around and that was always a big part of our family. And I learned like, classical piano for years. And, you know, later on at uni, I did a undergraduate in music, um, in composition. So yeah, I guess, I guess it's always, it's always been in my life. That in qualifies you as a lifetime musician, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I so, guess. So when was the time you decided to, uh, go as an artist instead of just doing this as a hobby? Um, actually prior to, well, I started off as an artist and then, um, I released an EP. This would have been quite a while ago now. And then I ended up doing songwriting for other people. Um, I was sort of more drawn into that way of that way of working because I I really liked being in the studio and I really liked writing more than I liked touring. So I, I thought that that was a good lifestyle for me. <laughs> and um, there was an artist uh, at who wasn't well known at the time called Passenger and we did some stuff together and when he became quite well known and some of the things that we had done kind of took on a life I started getting a lot of phone calls and requests to write with artists so yeah I, I, I've had a cool career as a songwriter and I've written with um with a bunch of people um much bunch of great artists and producers And then I guess um, I, I put my artist career on the back burner um, until sort of a couple of years ago, um, I moved to London from Australia and um, I sort of resurrected my artist career and uh, started writing songs and putting them out again. And then um, at the start of you know, last year, after that freaking crazy year that 2020 was, I mean, it's still, <laughs> still pretty crazy now. Um, <laughs> I, I um, ended up, <laughs> yeah, I ended up getting a really, I, I've got a, an arts grant um, to help me release my record, um, my favourite record. And um, the uh, Australian government decided I had enough credits as a songwriter that they would give me some money to put this record out. So, uh, yeah, here we are. Was this your pivotal moment that you decided, okay, I will go full force with it or, or were there a couple of events that led to you being the full-time musician um the p p i don't know if there was a pivotal moment i think that the the passenger moment probably is what um motivated the songwriting career choice and then the artist career choice going back to my artist roots i guess uh It sort of came about, I was spending a lot of time in Los Angeles as a songwriter. I was going between Sydney and Los Angeles and writing with artists. And I got to this point where I was going into the studio and writing with a lot of artists that I didn't necessarily believe, <laughs> believe in anymore. And, um, you know, Instagram models and people that had a really great social media following that had like zero talent whatsoever. And I thought, well, I would rather be doing a corporate job than doing this is just the same. So um, I need to go back to what made me kind of want to do this in the first place, which is, you know, writing, being in the studio, writing my own songs, um, uh, telling, telling my own story, creating stories that, you know, that might be about other people. Um, I, I suppose that doesn't really answer your question, but yeah, I don't think there was a pivotal moment as such. Um, it was, you know, moving to a new city and circumstances that made me decide that songwriting was probably not what I wanted to focus on anymore for songwriting for other people. That is. Mm -hmm. Was there any specific reason that you traveled so much between all those countries? Is it because of the opportunities you got there? Um, I think, well, Los Angeles is a, there's a, there's a very, big songwriting business there um so yes it was opportunities I was just getting called into sessions every day that I was there and you know 
um, working with a few really great companies and major labels that were pulling me into sessions with their artists. Um, and Australia is, you know, it's, it's far away. It's a lot smaller. Um, there's there's fewer channels there for um, you know for artists to really make a big name for themselves. So. Yeah, Los Angeles is like, I, I, I was planning to move to Los Angeles eventually, actually, but our circumstances, um, I'm married. Um, my husband was offered a job over here and we, we came here instead. Because you just said uh, Australia was smaller, so you, you refer to the music scene and not the country size, I guess. <laughs> no, that's right. The, <laughs> the music scene is smaller than, yeah, the country is oh. obviously massive. So that is like um, my... I don't know if you can hear that. Yes, <laughs> so, yes like, I was like, wondering what that is. Creaky. It is uh, my chair. It's not me, I swear. <laughs> no, not a problem at all. So um, if you wouldn't have gone the musician path, uh, was there a dream you would have followed instead? Like, I don't know, becoming a professional mover or something? <laughs> I think I probably would have become a journalist. Um, I, did a, I did a master's degree. Um, in, in journalism and PR. And that was, you know, that that actually was my, that's always what the plan was, I think more so than music. Um, music just, I, I didn't tell you before, I, I actually, I, I, I know, I didn't tell anybody that I sang or wrote songs and I started uploading to YouTube and, you know, something went crazy there. And that was really the, okay, that was my pivotal moment. Is actually ah, there we have it <laughs> ah, yeah um so yeah I, i uploaded the song called said the raindrop to the seed which um yeah like it just got a lot of views and i ended up getting people writing to me from all over the world um saying that they sung their song they sung the song to the babe to their baby as had fallen asleep and that it meant so much to them and their mother or they walked their, their bride down the aisle to it um Yeah, what was the what was the question that led me to this? That led me back to the question that you asked me originally. The thing you would have done instead of of being a musician. yeah. So I, I I think I think Jen, I think a journalist is, is I have a I have a you know a real inquisitive mind and a natural curiosity that I think it might have taken me into some I might have been a war a war zone journalist or something like that. <laughs> does, does this PR uh, background help you nowadays with promoting your own stuff? Oh, definitely, yeah. I think, I think, I think write, knowing how to write and how to market mm -hmm. a little, a little bit because, I mean, I'm much better at doing it for other people than <laughs> myself. You know, when you're doing, you know, doing your own PR requires you to have to blow your trumpet really hard, which I'm, I'm not generally very good at. Um, if you wanted me to do your PR, I would just be all over that. Yeah, KMS um, Reviews, if you want some PR and marketing, <laughs> I'm yeah, your lady. I, I, always, I always thought of myself as being the, the shy, humble guy in the back. So uh, whenever it comes to, uh, to PR and marketing myself and advertising, I always sit there for hours trying to think of something funny, something energy rich and th something that connects with people, always ending with, Ah, oh, nah, nah. I, I better pay for someone to do it instead of doing it myself. Yeah, I think some, sometimes trying to find that, you know, quote or something memorable, it's, it's much better in the hands of somebody else because they'll, they'll see through, you know, they'll see through everything and spot it. They'll, 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 they'll not bury the lead where you will when, when it comes to yourself. Yeah, that's true. So when we first planned the interview, um, I wanted to talk about your track Cynical, but uh, you were so busy in the meantime that you released an album just like that. <laughs> so uh, we're here uh, talking about the album Hemispheres you just released on November 5th. Can you give us a quick overview of the album? How did this come to life? Sure. Um, it's funny you say just like that for me. <laughs> It doesn't feel just like that. I've had these songs um, sort of sitting on my hard drive for about four years now, I guess. But it feels really great now that it's out in the world and that I can share them with everybody. And um, I'm very proud of it. And I'd say it's um, I'd say it's sort of a modern new wave style um, and very optimistic. The songs, um, I think, have a, a good amount of light and shade and, um, 
you know, what, where there's darkness, there's light. Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, last Friday it came out and it's, um, yeah, it feels like just like that for you, but <laughs> it feels like it's been a while for me, a while coming. Is and, it, um, is it a full story you told with the single tracks, uh, packed together because you also released the single, uh, partly the single tracks of the album before, I guess. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was, um, I actually had planned to release the album a lot sooner, which is probably why I released one of one of the first track I released in this record was Dance in the Rain, which I released almost two years ago. Um, because mostly I'd planned to release the album sooner. But um, it, yeah, I, I think as I mentioned before, I, I received, I was really lucky to receive an Australian Council for the Arts grant, um, which helped me to, you know, put the record and put everything together in order to release it properly. And um, <laughs> To pay for mixing and mastering and all of those things that all you know cost um and the result is something i think i, I got I, here's one i prepared earlier <laughs> um I, it actually it, it, it arrived in a, in a in vinyl i mean i ordered it in vinyl um but when when the vinyls arrived at my house i I planned on I planned on sharing the video of me opening the box on social media, but I just I cried and cried and cried because it was such a big moment of like actually seeing your album on vinyl. It kind of makes it real. Yeah, I think uh, to to produce it, to make it, and create it is one thing, but to actually see it cemented in the industry out there, so to speak, uh, it's another whole another thing. So yeah, that's right. Um, did you do all of this yourself or do you have a crew that's behind you uh, taking care of uh, as you just said, mixing, mastering, producing, advertising uh, and so on? Yeah, so I mean, I tend to, um, like I like to be quite involved in making the music. Um, so pretty much all of the tracks, except for well, one of the songs is a cover, Cathedrals, by a band called Jump Little Children. And um, there was another song, Cynical, and so I hooped as well, actually, where the music was sort of, there was, there was a structure already in place um, where I wrote, you know, the melody and top line. But for the, for the rest of the tracks, I'm very much involved. In, I write the chord progression. Um, and uh, I, I generally like to write the top line. Um, Don't Fight It was like a true co-write um, with a friend of mine, Rich Jarks, who's a Grammy winner. And... Um, Tinas, who has a project called Gold, Gold Kimono, that was a that was a true co-write where we just came together one Hollywood afternoon and you know jammed the song out in 20 minutes. And then there's a few a few songs where um, I sort of you know uh, they're they're co-written with um, my ex, We Are the Brave. Who's, we were in a duo together called We Are the Brave. Um, a producer called Ox Y in in Sydney. And I mean, his role really was, you know, textual sounds and I would sort of write chords and then write top lines and um, we would sort of get together and choose lots of little bits and pieces that we would work on. Um, but I generally, I, I mean, I have a very different process for every song, but, you know, I think there's a there's this stereotype with with female singers that, you know, you walk into a studio and you write the top line of a song um and that's not you know always the case and definitely in my in my situation i like to write the music um that's what inspires the melody for me and um yeah and and having done a back you know i've, I've got an undergraduate in music and um having a background composition helps with that too so when you say you have a very different approach to every other track how come that the general theme of the whole album has this retro flavor textures and you, you you can hear actually that is that is your work because that there's a signature stamp on it with this I, i'd say uh, retro flavor um is this coincidence or is this part of who you are uh, using those textures and synths i think that's definitely part of who i am as an artist and and, and that is um also probably the influences that you know, I, I, I was listening to and I, I've always sort of um, tended to listen to more, more. I listen to a lot of classic records. I mean, I listen to lots of like modern records as well, but I, I love classic records and I love, you know, I love that old school pop sound where, uh, uh, where you, 
<laughs> um, classic as in, I guess, like Fleetwood Mac and um, Tom Petty um, and Prince and um, a lot of a lot of new wave, Blondie, um, David Bowie. Uh, it, it's the type of music that I, I listen to the most and therefore I think it comes out in the style of music that I write. And, um, you know, whenever I've, when I've, 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 I've pulled in a collaborator, I think they're very across, you know, I, I hope I, I hope I would be considered as quite generous in a songwriting room um, and not bullish, but I have a very clear, you know, understanding of the sound that I'm, I'm looking for if, if, if collaborators get involved with me. And with, you know, I was really lucky to have some amazing mixes work with me on this record too. I think they brought a lot to the sound um, in terms of, you know, a certain vocal style and a certain reverb and would you say would you consider yourself defensive when it comes to your general idea of how something is mixed or uh, put in the front in the back or would you consider yourself the boss in the room who says nah that's way too loud that's way too much in the back um i, I think you always you, you should always compromise and i think whoever you're working with, there should, there should be a, um, a nice flow between you. I don't ever want to be the person that goes, no, that's too loud, that's this or that. Um, if somebody thinks that my vocal is too loud and, you know, I'll hear them out and let them adjust it to where they think it should be and I might think, well, yes, that's better. <laughs> um, but, but I think, I mean, I, I, I think that I have the last word um, and it's, I guess, important for me that I you know, work with people that respect me enough that um, understand the, the style that I'm going for. Um, also that I, I have res equal respect for them. Um, and when they kind of come at me with ideas, I'll be receptive always. Um, but, you know, I think I think I have the last word. Yeah. Was there any uh, a time where you got into a fight or argument about some specifics of a song? Um, <laughs> for this record, no, I mean, not, um, for this record, oh, there, there was a time. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I, I would say, I, you know, and I'm sure he'd be okay with me discussing this. Ox, Oxwire and I, um, we, we, we had a very volatile <laughs> relationship when we were in We Are the Brave and he, but we also write really, you know, great. I think we write really cool tunes together because he, lets me do my thing and he lets me be a writer and he adds, you know, color and, you know, it's so great. And he'll sometimes challenge me and say, no, that's cheesy. Like, don't do it like that. And, and he'll be right. Um, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, not generally, I generally, I'm not, I'm not a very argumentative or volatile person, um, I would say that particular relationship was only because we had different ideas about doing things. I think there has different to be different, different styles. Yeah, I think there has to be a certain chemistry. And this also could be a chemistry where people fight all day, uh, or they just get along. But uh, once this chemistry is there, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you do it together. So that's right i think i think that that you're exactly right and that the chemistry can you know if if you have that sort of volatility it can it can sometimes be magical because you can you can you know you can meet in the middle um mm. yeah i think i think with us it was just it was like this kind of he was an autodidact and i you know i would never put myself in the same category as a lot of my friends who are incredible you know trained musicians but like there's this classical kind of person versus this autodidact and um yeah sometimes we just had different ideas <laughs> as long as it didn't end in a fist fight everything's okay <laughs> <laughs> that, never so yeah. you, you said before that you uh, prefer the studio uh, music type over the live gig type is that correct um I love playing live, that don't get me wrong, but I I think um I think after I especially after I was in Los Angeles for a while, I, I think I, I became very aware of how uh marketable you you, you know your Im the image is almost everything and the music is so secondary to that and the style and I I, I think I I didn't 
I didn't really love the idea of putting myself, posting myself out there. Um, so, you know, whereas I loved songwriting and I loved connecting with people and, you know, people would, um, I, I think, I think when you're in a songwriting room with someone, as much as it is about writing the tune, it's about, um, it's having a, a really, a real experience with someone and, you know, often you'll, you'll meet strangers that you've never met before. You know, I might, I might meet you and we might decide to write a song together and there has to be a huge amount of trust that takes place. Um, I, I really like, I like that a lot. And I, I, I consider myself quite a people person and I like to make people feel comfortable. Um, so being in a room with, with a young artist, especially if they've got, especially if they're good and they've got something great to say um, and they've got an idea about, you know, the, the type of music they want to make, I can, I feel I can really help shape their ideas. Mm. Um, COVID aside, uh, let's just imagine for a moment there never has been something like COVID. Uh, is there a place you would want to play live uh, next? And if there is, why this special place? Um, Gosh, I think I, I think somebody asked me this recently. I love the Hollywood Bowl. Um, that's one of my favorite venues. It's really special to me for lots of reasons, and I love and I would love to play Red Rocks with with anyone. Um, if it was myself or singing backup vocals or you know playing keyboards or something. Um, I mean, even being like behind the scenes of Glastonbury would be pretty great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah. I, I do I do love playing live I think there's nothing like live I just don't I never enjoyed touring mm, I think it's a lot of stress and uh, due to the, the the heavy workload I I always imagine there's some uh, fun missing uh, that you might have uh, being in the studio or uh, might have playing at the, I don't know once a month in the local uh, pub or something like this. So if you have this this really tight schedule, play there, 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 and there, and this was just one day. <laughs> so uh, it, yeah. it, might, it might take away a bit of the, the fun and soul out of this, if it takes time. I think, there's, I think there's a lot of sacrifices that you need to make as well. You know, if you choose to live like that on the road, basically, it's going to affect, you know. Totally. <sighs> it, yeah. It's going to affect things in your life, so, negatively and positively. Yeah, yeah, both both kinds of <laughs> correct. So, uh, when the, the album just released, uh, what's next for you? Is, are there any plans for 2022? Um, so, I've got a, co a couple of collaborations in the works, and then um, I'm planning an album launch early next year. So, I haven't quite confirmed the date, but um, a London album launch probably oh. around February. And um, potentially uh, we'll be doing a bit of touring if, if <laughs> around the record. That's so. a big if, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I am, you know, I, I really, I'm looking forward to playing the songs live and just connecting with people who, you know, listen through and. No, I, I, um, I was referring to the whole COVID mess out there, not, not, not your preference of playing live. So, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. So your question was if there was no such thing as COVID. No, no. It's it's just uh, once once the, the smoke has cleared regarding COVID, I think oh, the yeah. live gig uh, is uh, once again is possible. You're not that type yeah. that hides somewhere uh, at home, but uh, you have to have the right the right setting and the right uh, yeah yeah <laughs> you know the, 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 even the the location and everything. And if you're playing in front of 50 people that are they're standing uh, two meters away from each other wearing masks, that also takes away uh, a lot of the soul and 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 fun and, and that. So I guess. We have to wait. At least it's my opinion that uh, live gigs are worth it once this is over. Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I think I think some of the restrictions. I don't know what it's like where you are. I think that they're, they're starting to lift here where there there aren't you know the social distancing rules. Of yeah, they, they start to do that here, but uh, with the numbers, I guess they will stop doing that soon. Yeah, so, yeah. that's right. God, it feels it. relentless, isn't it? Just mm, I, it does. If, when are we going to come out of this? <laughs> God, 
but to as a positive thought to end this <laughs> uh, i love to hear that you have so many uh, projects up your sleeve that you're not planning to just uh sit on the couch all day and uh, watch movies, <laughs> but you have uh, several other projects to come and I'm eagerly awaiting to hear more of you. Thank you so much. So Jess, thank you very much for meeting me tonight. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, guys, if you want to know more about uh, the work, the work of uh, Jess Choker, please make sure to uh, check out the links in, at the end of the video. That's it for tonight. All I have to say is be safe. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.